unrepented sin, have not been gracious, have not been compassionate, have not been based on relationship. And it's part of the reason so many people in our world today, right, a large percentage of people in our community do not see church as a helpful part of their life. And for some of them, the story is, it's because the church people have hurt me. It's because what I feel more than anything else is judged and condemned. And we ought to listen closely when we hear that in the midst of what's taking place in this world. Because that's sure not what we want them to experience with Jesus. Yes, Jesus is, as they connect with Jesus, as they start a relationship, as they allow God's word and his voice to be a part of their life, God is going to confront that sin. But so often we've said to people, look, clean your life up, get your act together, act like church people, then you're welcome here. Instead of actually what it says on that header when you walk in this door, that everyone, all people are welcome here. No matter how far from God you are, no matter how close you think you are to God, we hope that everyone would feel welcome to come and to be able to experience relationship with us and encourage one another in this journey of faith. So today we're going to confront, I think, one of the big challenges within our own lives. I, I, I feel this very personally. I want to start by just reading this quote. This is from Wesley Granberg Michelson, and this he wrote an article called The Heresy of Individualism. It was in the banner in April 27, 2020, but he says this, and I think about how true this is. Society is constructed as if I is at the center of everything. The bottom line is that my rights, my prerogatives, my desires, my fulfillment, and my wishes come first. Now, in the church on a Sunday, I don't think any of us would say, well, that's that's what we should do. That's who we are. But let's be honest. Let's be honest about how true this statement actually is. And maybe how true it is actually in our own lives. That it is so easy to live in the fallacy that I am the center of the world. That what I feel, what I think, what I want ought to be what drives my life. And let's be honest. At times, that's how we live. We live as if that's true. And it's one of the great challenges the church faces today, that we have to keep confronting this really unhealthy, self-centered focus on ourselves and how much that's been brought into the life of the church. That sometimes the most common complaint that we hear in church is, I'm not getting what I want. Not about mission, not about impact in this community, not about what God's up to. It's, I don't like what I'm not getting. And so as a result, you know, we see this present within our culture. We see this present within this church, these challenges, individualism being one of them. In, individualism is independence and self-reliance. And again, see the word self. One of the core foundations of being a follower of Jesus is embracing this constant recognition that I am dependent upon God as I seek to live in this world. To know who I am, to know why I'm here. To have the power to do that which isn't about me, but is about him. Right? To consistently live a life that really does embrace what Jesus showed us. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That's not just outside of my life, that's including my life. And, you know, hedonism's been around forever because sin's been around forever. But this challenge, this recognition that sometimes our life can really just become about how I feel. And it's a fascinating history, you know, to take a look at since God created humankind and sin came into this world, how hedonism has been such a priority even celebrated and encouraged in certain cultures. And it's one of the things that Christianity confronted in its own journey. It's one of the things that made Christianity stand out and ex was exclusive about Christianity is how much it fought against this idea that it's all about how I feel. It's all about getting pleasure in this world. But let's be honest how temp tempting it is to be a hedonist to be caught up in, I just want to feel good. I don't want to suffer. I want to feel good things, so I'm going to do things that allow that to take place. 
And again, he keeps coming back to, it's all about me. Or consumerism. Right? We all live in a world that we are in some ways going to be consumers. We do consume food and goods and services. It's part of how the, the world functions. But there's this unhealthy part of consumerism that puts it at the forefront of how we live. It becomes about consumption, that that is ultimately what defines us is we consume. And again, the challenge is that's been brought into the life of the church. Right? And my role as a pastor is not primarily customer service. Right? That I'm here to make sure that you're getting what you want. That's not what the church staff or the church leadership exists for, is to foster consumerism in the life of the church. And please don't hear that as this is all about you, this is all about us, because I can just as much bring that consumerism into church as anybody else can and want what I want and want the church to give me what I want. It's part of the challenge that all of us face. One of the definitions of consumerism that got my attention was this. This is from A.J. Higgins in his article, A Christian Worldview Consumerism. He says this, It is the consumption of goods and services to satisfy desires which exceed human need. I think that's so interesting. Right? Because that crosses a line. Right? When it becomes beyond what we actually need. That this is what satisfies us. This is what fulfills us. This is our purpose. How far that is from the purpose God's called us to. And to recognize, as you probably already know, if this is what you make your life about, you will never be satisfied. You will never be fulfilled. There's always more to consume. There's always more that you'll want. And so, you know, we have to be honest. We have to confess consistently in our life that this can be our motto. My kingdom come, my will be done. And it's why this text in the Gospel of Matthew, I'm also going to surface it out of the Gospel of John, ought to be a core foundation of how we embrace a journey with Jesus. Because this text is so core to the calling that God has given us and to the challenge that we face in this conversation today that we have to keep fighting against with God's help and the Holy Spirit's leading this voice that encourages us to believe that it is about my kingdom coming and my will being done. And in this creative way that we're going about this series with this idea of trying to get folks to wake up, trying to get the church to wake up, trying to encourage ourselves together to wake up, to set off the alarm so we see clearly this is not taking us where we want to go, we're going to start talking about some lullabies that lull us to sleep. And today it's the me time lullaby. And looking at the Gospel of Matthew and a little bit out of Ecclesiastes and also how you see this same story, the same message that Jesus gives in the Gospel of John. So here we are, Matthew 16, beginning in verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. So as Jesus was walking alongside the disciples, as he was doing his ministry, he began to help them recognize what lay ahead. And though they didn't fully understand what he talked about, here here he again is indicating, look, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. That's part of the journey that lies ahead. One of the, um, F. Del Bruner, who's one of the commentaries that I find really helpful in the Gospel of Matthew, actually re, kind of paraphrases this text and tries to, at times, contemporize it. And he talks about how this isn't the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, but if you think about it today, it's the senior pastors. It's the consistory. It's the religious folk. That we're not getting what Jesus was trying to communicate. But then here we see verse 22. Look at Peter's response, right? Jesus is sharing what lies ahead. Peter's response, verse 22. And Peter took him aside, took him aside, right? 
Jesus, you and I need to talk. Just you and me. I've got some things I need to share with you, right? And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. It's one of the things you have to at least respect to some level about Peter. As at times foolish, we see Peter be in the midst of this. Part of that foolishness reflects the reality that he's human like us, and we see him challenged by what he's experiencing. At least he has the courage, the willingness to express what's so for him, to tell the truth that he holds, even though it may be misguided, as we clearly will see. But he basically says to Jesus, I'm not going to let this happen. This can't be the plan. The plan can't be that you're going to suffer and you're going to die. How can you be the Messiah? How can you be the Savior? How can you be the one the Old Testament prophets pointed towards, that we've looked forward to, that you're going to die and suffer? How can that be? Can't be. Verse 23, but Jesus turned and said to Peter, can you imagine Jesus saying these words to you? Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block for me. For you are setting your minds not on divine things, but on human things. And this text comes soon after Jesus gave Peter the name, the rock, right? And upon you I will build my church. But here we see the temptation that exists in Peter and in all of us to say, whoa, 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 not not your will, God, but mine. Not what you're going to do, but what I want to see happen. What I think needs to take place in my life, and in what you do. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. I mean, day after day after day, that temptation exists for all of us. Right? And the consistent decisions that we make each and every day, all the opportunities that present themselves, we, we, we make a decision. Am I going to set my mind? Am I going to live my life based on what God has called me to, what God says? Or am I going to choose me? I'm going to choose what I want, what I feel is best. Over and over and over again, you and I have the opportunity to make those choices. And I just was really drawn to this phrase, get behind me. So Jesus says, get behind me. Remember your place. Remember who you are. Remember who I am. Remember where you and I ought to stand. Not as the one to lead God, not as the one to lead Jesus, but to be a follower. Get behind me. Maybe that's a phrase that I think in the midst of our willingness to keep coming before God that we hear in those moments when it is my will, when it is my kingdom, when it is, let me tell you, God, what should happen. Get behind me. Remember who you are. Remember who I am. Remember that you are not God. And remember in that remembrance of God, that God knows what's best. God's all-knowing. God is perfect. God is not only just, but he's gracious and compassionate. Nobody holds the tension of truth and grace like God does because he does it perfectly. And so, he is so worthy to follow because he's going to lead you. He's going to lead me. He's going to lead our church. He's going to lead us where we need to go. And sometimes we have to hear with maybe some confrontation, maybe some conviction, maybe some challenge, get behind me. Because you are putting yourself in the wrong place. Eftel Brunner summed this final statement up in this way, which just got my attention too. You are a big problem to me because you are not gripped by the concerns of God, but by the concerns of human 
beings. And part of what I hope that we hear in this is not only is this a statement that Jesus expresses grounded in his love, but he also helps, to, he knows that if we choose this human plan, if we choose this human way, if we're driven by ourselves, there are consequences to that. There is separation. There is a lack of abundance and fullness that this will hurt us and the people we love. This will keep the church from having the impact that God calls the church to have because we're going to be about ourselves, not about the things of God. But I want to continue in the text because Jesus really not only confronts what Peter's doing, but he also shows him the way. This is the way. Right? This is how you and I are called to live. Verse 24, then Jesus told his disciples, if any want to become my followers, right, to get behind me, to stay in that place, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Now, if you've been in the church, you've heard this, you've probably heard this sermon preached over and over and over again seen this text multiple times. It's such an important part of confronting what we're talking about today. It shows the way of followers of Jesus Christ that there is a denying of self that has to be consistent in the midst of our life. We don't do to, simply do that once when we accept Jesus. It is a day-to-day, -day, often moment-to-moment -moment practice that we have to say no to self. Say no to wanting to be God. Say no to wanting to be the object of worship. To say no to the pleasures that so often tempt us. To say no, say no to the desires, those unhealthy, fleshly desires that continue to rear themselves within our lives. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Verse 25, for those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake, we'll find it. Do you believe that? Do you believe what Jesus is saying here? What does your life say? What has God already shown you and what you've experienced? What is the testimony of Scripture? Right? The revelation of God from the time that we were created and sin entered this world, and we have story after story after story of people obeying and disobeying God, experiencing blessing, experiencing cursing, wrestling with their humanness. What does the testimony of Scripture, what does the testimony of your life say over and over and over again? That if we make our life about us, if we are the center, if we're the object of worship, if we know what's best, our life is a mess. And we create a mess for those around us. Because if, if you are at the center, then you are selfish. right? The center of your life is you. And in those moments when you choose that way, it impacts the lives of the people around you. It impacts your witness and your testimony into this world about what it means to follow Jesus Christ. It's part of why so many people don't come to church is because they look at the hypocrisy and we're all hypocrites. We all fall short. Don't hear me say any of us are doing this perfectly, but we're willing to be settled in that hypocrisy. We're willing to live in that place where I go to church and I say God's loving and I'm supposed to love, but my life really doesn't reflect that commitment. Do you believe this? Do you believe it? Not just in your head on Sunday morning at church, but in how you're choosing to live your life. Do you see the fruitfulness that comes when we are faithful to God? And yes, please don't hear me say any of us are doing this perfectly. But the story of our life tells something about how God knows exactly what he's talking about. Verse 26, he goes on, For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world? Right? So you get what you want. 
You get the job, you get the career, you get the house, you get the boat, you get the IRA, you get the vacations, you get the second home, you get the prestige in our world today, you get looking good in front of other people, you get all the things that you've made your life about because it's been about you. What will it profit them if they gain all of that but really forfeit your life? Chris Mackey's kind of become our guru of spiritual practices here at Community Reformed Church. He wouldn't mind if you would call him guru. That wouldn't be a bad thing. But he's been helping us navigate some of this. And, and one of the things that he took our staff through this week was we went through this practice of examine, which is you spend some time in reflection, reflecting on the previous day. And he asked some questions along the way as you reflect upon your previous day. And one of the questions he asked that still continues to strike me is where did you feel most alive yesterday? Where did you feel most alive? And where did you feel most d disconnected from God? And it was so clear to me because it was a Sunday. He asked this question on a Monday, so I'm reflecting on a Sunday. So I've got the church experience as part of that day. I've got coming home as part of that day in my Sunday afternoon, Sunday night routine. And it was so interesting to me that where I felt most alive was where I was serving and giving and listening and encouraging. And where I felt most connected was where I was most selfish. Because I have that temptation coming home from church on Sundays. Now it's all about me. Right? Right? But that's where I feel most disconnected. What will it profit them? What will it profit you? If you gain the whole world, if you get what the world offers, if you buy the world's lies, but you forfeit your life, you forfeit the investment that God's called you to make in your marriage, you forfeit the investment that God calls you to make in your children, you forfeit the opportunity to be salt and light to the people you work with, you forfeit those moments of really being alive, being in the will of God, experiencing God's fruitfulness being made known through you. Or what will they give in return for their life? What are you willing to give to experience that life? A life that lines up with how you're designed. A life that helps you experience God. Know who you are. A life that clarifies purpose and helps you to experience the gifts of hope and joy and peace and grace. What's that worth? Sorry, I didn't put that slide up. So let's talk about a few of those things real quickly. Deny self, right? I think so often when we hear this, we just, we, we, we hear it, and this is appropriate, we hear it through this lens of I need to say no to the things that are selfish, right? I don't need a full quart of ice cream at night, right? I don't need to drink a 12-pack of beer. I don't need to do these things that really, in the moment, feel good, but lead me astray. I need to say no, right? That part of what I encourage what I see so clearly in my life is, is my life, I experience so much more fullness of the life that God has for me by my growing capacity to tell myself no. Right? To say no to the things that seem so attractive that I want, that are a short-term gain, but separate me from the life that God has for me. And so it gets at that need versus want idea, right? That one of the ways that we live more faithfully is we really live in our needs the way that God's designed us and we recognize that he's the primary source of meeting those needs and we allow him to be the one we turn to and when we look at the provision that he's provided for us when we look at what we have and we see that he's the source of it and one of the incredible things that God has done probably in all of our lives is he's given us more than we need and he's called us then to be one 
who stewards what he's given us well, and that part of the journey for us is being willing to sacrifice and serve and give away that which he's given to us, whether it's time, whether it's relationships, whether it's money, whether it's resources. Part of the journey of Jesus is being willing to give and in some sense to recognize it's part of what we need to do. But the other piece that really got my attention this time around in looking at this text is this isn't just about navigating those things, but it's also raising a primary question. This denying of self raises such an important question, and that's this. Who is your primary allegiance to? Is it to you, or is it to Jesus? And yeah, moment by moment, that probably fluctuates, but what does the, what the majority of the time say? What is the norm for you? That my allegiance is first and foremost to myself, to my wants, to what I want to see take place, to my control, to my pleasure, to my, need, to my not needs but wants, or is my primary allegiance to Jesus? Then when I think about my job, am I thinking about is this best for me, or how am I a servant of Jesus in my workplace? When I think about my marriage, do I think simply about what do I want from this? What do I deserve? What does she owe me? Or am I thinking about what has God called me to be as a husband who honors and serves and encourages his wife in her relationship with Jesus and in the way of life that he's called us to? When you think about any aspect of your life, who is your primary allegiance to? Who is, who is guiding you in the midst of that? You? What you want? You think? Or him? And then this interesting language of take up your cross. And I think we've really minimized in our culture that language. Because we say things like this, we all have our crosses to bear, right? And we may mean, you know, that coworker that talks too much. We all have our crosses to bear. And it really minimizes, I think, what, what Jesus is seeking to express here today. I mean, think for a moment about what actually happens at crucifixion. One of the interesting pieces is those who are convicted, who, who, who have to be crucified, those who have been deemed worthy of crucifixion, not only are going to die the most humbling, humiliating, painful death that probably any human being could die, but the final act of humiliation is they have to carry the instrument that will take their life. They have to drag this cross as the final punishment that actually will take their life, they have to carry that instrument of death. And what it reminds us of is that when we think about taking up our cross, it is complete and utter submission. We truly humble ourselves completely. And it reminds us, hopefully, of what Jesus calls us to. Like in Galatians 2, I have been crucified with Christ. Right? There is a death that's part of the journey of faith. And that death isn't just a one-time, pray the prayer, now I'm a follower of Jesus. It is that dying to self that takes place over and over and over again. That denying self and that willingness to take up our cross and embrace that, to live as God calls me to live and to embrace the identity he's created me with and called me to and offered me through grace. I have to keep dying to that self, dying to that old way of life, dying to that voice in my head that says it's all about you. And finally, follow me. And I don't think I'm going to be able to hear follow me any longer without get behind me as part of it. And, and I hope that you hear the get behind me as love. Because sometimes we need to say it more strongly. Sometimes we have to raise the level of our voice a little bit. Sometimes to get that conviction to be heard, get behind me, Chip. Because right now you're in front. Right now you're the Lord of your life. Right now you think you know what's best. Right now you're trying to lead me or you're just simply walking away from me. Get behind me. Because God longs for us to gain life, not to lose it. 
I think of what Ecclesiastes says. You know, one of the more challenging books to read is Ecclesiastes. It feels like it's a book without hope. We believe it's probably written by King Solomon, who had everything. Everything. Richest man that probably has ever lived in this world. Had anything that he could possibly want. You hear him talk about the challenge of that within his life, that he sought after all of those things. He went after what the world could ha- offer because he basically could have anything that the world could offer. And in the midst of that challenge, he says this. This is Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 11. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it. And behold, it was vanity. It was a striving after the wind. And there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Right? If we put our hope in the things of the world, if we think, if we find enough pleasure, if we get the stuff that we want, if we give in to all the desires of our heart, that we're going to get what we want. That we're going to be satisfied, that we're going to be fulfilled, that we're going to be happy, that we're going to be content and at peace. And that is not true. And Solomon expresses that so clearly within his own experience. It's a chasing after the wind. You ever tried to chase the wind? It's fruitless. It's hopeless. We'll never catch it. So I just want to conclude with this text again, except found in the Gospel of John. Jesus throws a little bit of twist in here. It's such a helpful reminder of the invitation he gives us to his way of life. To a life that is really life. A life that we experience, the gifts that God has for us. A life that we, where we know We learn to live in who we really are. A life that makes a difference in a kingdom way in the lives of the people around us. Jesus says this, Very very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it. Those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life, right? Those who are willing to recognize that what the world offers will not give them what they are designed and created for, will not give them ultimately what they need. If you come to grips with that reality and you, tend, and you come to hate that life, just like Solomon expressed, that is not it, will keep their life, will experience life. Whoever serves me, Jesus says, must follow me, must get behind me. And where I am, there also my servant will be also. We will be together in this work. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. May God help us to live into that truth. Will you pray with me, please? God, we're so thankful for the gift of your word. And Father, I pray that these words, that in hearing them, even though there is conviction, even though there is challenge, that these are words of love, that this is you expressing love to us. It's calling us deeper into relationship with you. It's calling us to see more clearly what is true. It's calling us to experience life the life that you've created us for, the life that you've called us into, the life that through the sacrifice of Jesus that we can experience because you've offered us life with you. What a gift that life is. And so, Father, in those places where you've been poking at us through this message, help us to invite you to show us more clearly, to help us to step more deeply to help us to be filled with hope for what tomorrow will bring as we step more deeply into relationship with you. And Father, give us wisdom and give us the power by your Spirit to do exactly what you've called us to do. Deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Excuse me, if you, I'd like to invite you if you'd like to stand as we sing our last song.
gift it is that that identity is true. That through God's grace and the sacrifice of Christ, that we are children of God. May God help us in this week to live into that identity as we deny ourselves, take up the cross, and follow him. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.